A pivotal moment could be coming. Would you accept this rose? Child is spoken. This is going to be so cool. Good morning, everybody. How are you all doing today? All right? You excited to be here? I am, wow, good, this is a great response. I wasn't expecting such enthusiasm from the morning crowd. I am excited to be here. Uh, my name is Joe Miller, for those of you who haven't met, and uh, I'm glad to fill in for Phil, who's traveling somewhere, I don't know where, but uh, I'm sure he'll be around sometime. And I'll tell you a little bit more about myself as this thing unvi- uh, unveils today, because I'm glad for this opportunity. I've been on a kind of an amazing journey with God the last bunch of years. And I get to share a little bit about that with you today as we go through the passage we're going to look at. Most recently, though, I just got back from a trip to Tulsa, Oklahoma with my family. My lovely wife, Suzanne, my three sons, wonderful handsome boys, Zachary. Yes, Lord? You hear that ring? Is everyone hearing that ringing, or is that just me? Okay, just checking, because I thought there was a medical issue I might need help with. We're good, though. All right. So yeah, and so my three boys, Zachary, Nathan, and William, uh, all under 11. And, and I can tell you that uh, although it's a great adventure, there's nothing like traveling 3,400 miles with three boys under the age of 11 through the desert. <laughs> and can I tell you, in the desert, you just can't roll down the windows. And uh, some of you will get that joke in a little bit later. <laughs> so... It's the first time I've been back to Oklahoma in about 10 years. My parents live there. My sister lives there. I've been there a long time. But the weather really reminded me why it's been 10 years since I've been back there. Uh, We got to enjoy about 20-plus days of record-breaking, triple-digit weather in Oklahoma. Yeah, it was beautiful. Days were a lovely 115. About midnight, it cooled down to a relaxing 92 degrees got to swim in the pool occasionally, which was about 87 degrees in the pool. It was like taking a bath every day. I affectionately call the, the Midwest like God's sauna, because it is not a dry heat there. So we're on this adventure. It's great. Uh, and anytime you go on a trip, obviously there's a lot of roadblocks, and there's speed bumps, and there's detours, all the kind of construction that goes on. And it's okay. You don't mind that stuff. If, like me, you have a GPS named Mandy, and she can guide you through all those things. And and she tells you soothing, relaxing words like, turn left now. And you're okay, because you don't get lost. Unfortunately, though, life is not like that with the GPS. Because you run into all these challenges in life, but there's not always a sense of direction of where you're going. So when I was back there, I was visiting with some old friends from my seminary days. uh, And... Some people are doing great, and others are not so great. I, I met with my one friend, Mike. Well, actually, I tried to meet with him. We never got together. But my one friend, Mike, I mean, we went to seminary together. We were good friends, both with this dream uh, that we're on a journey to, you know, enter full-time ministry as pastors and lead congregations of people to deeper relationship with God. And now, 16 years later, he's divorced and agnostic. He doesn't even believe that God exists anymore. I mean, how do you get to that point in life? You you ever do those things, let's think of it this way. You ever do those things where you do a life plan? Like, you know, where are you going to be in five years from now or ten years from now? And you have to do those in college sometimes or even for job interviews. I always love that. You know, a job interview is like, oh, you know, where do you see yourself in five years? I'm like, I have no idea, you know. But they want to know this as if it's some kind of great thing. But did you ever notice that nobody's life plan says stuff like, yeah, in 10 years I see myself divorced, estranged from all my children, losing my house, balding, getting fatter, uh, you know, in huge credit card debt, and running away from God. I've never read that on a life plan. Yet, surprisingly, a lot of us end up somewhere in there. You know, we might not have all those problems, But maybe you see yourself as like, yeah, okay, I never thought 10 years ago I'd be where I'm at today. But yeah, you're there somewhere. And the real question is how? How is it that we get to that point where one day we have these great dreams, we have these great ideas, you know, we love God, we're serving God in our lives, and then all of a sudden, stuff happens. We're at this crossroads of faith and doubt. We find out we're at this intersection where we don't know what to believe anymore because life has kind of treated us roughly and 
it's not what we expected or not what we've, we've been told it should be, maybe. And that's where we come in with a guy named Asaph in Psalm 73. So if you're not familiar with the Bible, that's in the Old Testament. Psalm 73 is right between Psalm 72 and 74. So look that up. So Asaph was this really respected guy. As a matter of fact, he was the head musician for King David, one of the greatest kings in all the history of the nation of Israel. So just, again, if you're not familiar, let me contemporize that, give you an analogy. So King David would be, would be like Pastor Phil, right? Only King David had a lot more money and a lot more wives. Now the good news is, I, although Phil would like some more money, I'm sure he's happy with just one wife. So that analogy breaks down at some point, but just imagine that. And then Asaph would be like Aaron here, who's the head musician for Pathways, right? Except Asaph got to be the head musician for the entire nation of Israel. That's a great gig if you can get it, because I'm sure the health insurance was awesome. All right? So Asaph, who is this well-respected guy, wonderful guy, writes a little piece of poetry that really reveals this journey that he is on between faith and doubt. And I think it's marvelous when you think about this guy who's such a high position of esteem. You think, oh man, he's leading the worship for the entire nation. He must be this awesome guy and never questioning. But this whole psalm is about the doubts he experiences. And he's going through life and all these questions he has. So I'm really excited to share this with you because... In part, this is a little bit of my own journey. And I hope by sharing a little bit of Asaph's journey and my journey, maybe you see yourself in this mix and see where you're at. So to do that, as I was reading through this, by the way, it's a wonderful piece of Hebrew poetry. And specifically, it's called a chiastic poem. Uh, I made a bet with somebody that I wouldn't use that word chiastic in a sermon today, and I just won. So somebody owes me a dollar. Uh, so what that means, though, essentially is that the whole first half of this poem is building to a point. It deals with all these sort of speed bumps that Asaph has faced. Then it gets to the center of this poem, and he kind of reveals where this crossroads of faith and doubt is, right in the middle. And then the whole end of the poem, he kind of reveals these detours that God has given him around all these challenges. So I'm going to do my best today to kind of share with you Asaph's story and my story and be faithful to what's there and hopefully in a way that has some impact for you. So the first speed bump I want you guys to think about is this question that Asaph brings up. He says that God is good, but maybe he does not care for me. God is good, but maybe he doesn't care for me. We just sang a song, you know, confessing God's love and how, you know, God is loving and he's wonderful but Asaph, the challenge is, he's not denying God's goodness or God's love. He's saying, but maybe he doesn't really care for me. And that's our first little speed bump here. So we're going to mark that along our path right here. Look at Psalm 73, verse 1 and 2. It says, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But for me, that's the key phrase, but for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. See, he sees that God is a good God. He doesn't question God, who God is. And sometimes, you know, theologically we think, oh, if you're struggling in life, all you have to know is confess that God is a good God. Well, that's not his problem. His problem is God is good, but I don't think he really cares about me because I'm not upright. There's something wrong in my life and maybe he just doesn't love me anymore. Have you ever had that question? I've asked myself that question about, 16 dozen times in the last month and a half. And I'm not kidding either. I, I go through that question a lot. See, okay, so I was up in Seattle where we were living for about 13 years, doing a lot of ministry stuff up there. And most recently, uh, my family and I were planting a church. And uh, we ran into some sort of health issues with my wife living in the Northwest, all the mold and some other stuff. So we said, okay, we need to make a change. So we leave our church probably at the best time in our lives in that five-year experience planting a church. Everything was actually, I mean, it was pretty good. I mean, with the people, it was great, actually. But, you know, the economy hit. And so we had multiple people in our congregation losing jobs, losing their homes. We lost our own home to foreclosure. And, and that's kind of not fair, right? So I'll get back to that later. But I'm thinking, okay, this is not good. So, you know, 
we have health problems, we do this stuff, and I'm saying, God, if I'm giving my life to you, if I'm serving you with everything that I am, and I'm giving myself to you, why are you allowing this to happen? Don't you care about me anymore? I know you're a good God, but what have I done wrong? So we move down here, and I, I take a job with a software company, and, and I come down here and get to where the sun is shining, and it's nice and warm, and nobody ever complains about the weather until they have to go out and work in it on Saturday. By the way, there's an opportunity this week to work. I told Mike I'd mention that. So, again, so we do this, and then all of a sudden I get laid off from my job. So now I'm eight months unemployed. And I'm thinking, God, I, I have skills. I've been faithful to you. You know, I, I've served you with all of my heart, yet here I am in a place where I know you're good, but why aren't you good to me? Maybe you've walked that road a little bit, but that's where Asaph is. So there's a detour around that, but he skips that. We'll come back to that later. And now he gets to the second little speed bump. And he says, does God really care about what happens in the world? God, do you really care about what happens in the world? There's suffering, there's difficulties, there's challenges. Do you really even care? Are you engaged? And this is the question that he's facing. Look at verse 3. He says, For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Stop there for a second because that's a big heart issue for Asaph. He's looking at all these other people who are prospering and he sees that they're doing wickedness, yet they prosper. God, why are you allowing that to happen? That's not fair. It's not right. Harvard Business Review just did a study. I just read this like two weeks ago. Before I even knew I was talking about this, and I read this and it came back to my mind. They did a study and they said this, that um, of all the people that work, if you have more integrity, you will earn less. People of high integrity earn less than people with lower integrity. So if you want to do well in life, have less integrity. Apparently that's what the study says. But it's true in life for all realms. And Asaph has noticed this. Right? And he's saying, God, how is this right? He goes on, he says, For they have no pangs until their death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. That's a good thing, by the way. He doesn't mean that in a bad way. I mean, he's saying, you know, they have enough food to eat. Right? They're not just surviving, man. They're flourishing. It's like those old pictures you see of King Henry VIII of England and, you know, the guy who killed all his wives and stuff like that. But he's always like this big fat guy. And you think, oh boy, he's got some cardiovascular issues there. He might die. But no, to that, you know, at times, most in history, people of big size, that was success. So that's what he's talking about here. They have no, they have no suffering in their bodies. They're not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Again, that's supposed to be a good thing. You may not agree, but okay, that's Asaph. Their eyes swell out through big fat folds and stuff. That's pretty cool. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and they speak with malice. Lofty, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heaven and their tongues strut through the earth. And that last part is kind of cool because what Asaph is saying is, look, they're denying God that you have any authority in their life. They're denying that you're sovereign in this world. They're denying that you even care about what goes on. So they set their mouths in heaven. They say, hey, look, there is no God because I'm up here and I don't see him. And all this violent stuff they're talking about, like doing against other people, what it's talking about, what Asaph is seeing is that these people in their desire to succeed are willing to do whatever it takes. And they'll run over the little guy if they have to because they're going to be successful. And this bugs him because he's mocking God. these guys are mocking God and mocking God's people in the midst of their success and God doesn't seem to care one little bit about it. It says in verse 10, Therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, How can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. It says the people, his people, turn back to them. Asaph, what is he noticing? That there's people amongst Israel, people that know about God, who have chosen to follow after these people instead of following after God. 
He's worried about people being led astray by all these wicked people. And he sees this happen. He's saying, God, why do you allow that to happen? So when we were planting our own church, um, you know, we, to, to do a church plant is a very difficult thing, and you've got to you know, kind of take a lot of financial risk, but you've got to bring on partners of different kinds to help support that. And so when we were planting, we had lots of different partner churches and different organizations. Well, one of our first sponsors, or one of our first sponsors that helped us plant, uh, they found out about another partnership that we had. It wasn't a secret. It was on our website, but they found out about this. Uh, and then they accused me of being deceptive and horrible and, and like what they really are worried about is they wouldn't be able to take credit for all the success that we were, you know, supposedly going to have. And so they got mad. So what did they start to do? They started, there were several people from that church who had come to be a part of our church. So they started talking behind our backs and telling people that we were doing all these underhanded, dirty things. Again, all the stuff that was publicly on our website was apparently <laughs> secretive and horrible. Um, but we were doing all this stuff and they, and they started calling people. Uh, hey, you know, I know you're down there, but we really need you to come help with our Wednesday night uh, VBS. There's a church of like, 1,300 people who needed two people because without those two people, apparently their entire program was going to shut down. But they were just trying to draw people back, right? So here you have this, these people like kind of spreading rumors about us and doing this stuff, trying to pull people out of our little tiny church plant. And then I look at that and I say, okay, God, how is that right? I'm just doing what's right for you and here's somebody prospering. He's got great medical coverage for his family. I've got none. He's got a job. I've got none now. Is that right? God, I mean, don't you care that not only is this guy, you know, doing something wrong, but he's pulling people and harming people by spreading rumor and gossip and innuendo? Where are you in the middle of that, God? It's an easy question to have. And, I, and I'm guessing that a couple of you maybe have seen that kind of thing in your own life. Maybe it's people at work, and maybe it's not in a Christian situation where it's in the church, but maybe it's just at your workplace and you've seen somebody who's a, a boss do underhanded, dirty stuff, and all of a sudden they advance and you're not doing so well. And you wonder, and that's where Asaph is struggling. He's got a detour for that one too, but we'll get back to that. Meanwhile, there's a third speed bump right here. <clears throat> Marks his little journey. He says that he has this question Is living and sacrificing for God? really worth it? Is living and sacrificing for God really worth it? Man, that's a great question. Verse 13, he says, All in vain I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generations of your children. So what's going on here? He says, look, it's been useless to remain pure for you, God. Following your commands, keeping myself above reproach, all the things we hear, you know, Phil and everybody else preach about, all the things we read in the Bible, he's saying, look, all this has been a waste of my time. Why should I bother? It's like that Harvard Business Review study, you know, it's like, if, if the people with less integrity prosper and do better, why am I bothering to try to keep my heart pure, God. But I love where he closes with this. Because in questioning whether he should live for God or sacrifice for God, he notices there's something else happening here. And he, and he brought it up in the last verse. He mentioned how, you know, God's people were being led astray and that bugged him, right? He says this in 15, he says, if I, if I would have said this, I would have betrayed the generations of your children. See, so we know that basically this journey and all these challenges that Asaph is facing has brought him to this crossroads of faith and doubt. And now he's starting to recognize this is all going on in his head, this is all a, a spiritual struggle that he's having, but he hasn't take, taken action on these things yet, right? He hasn't actually rejected God. He's still at this crossroads recognizing what should I do? I had another friend who was church planting, and, and if you've not been around church planting, guys, you know, my story is really absolutely no different than any other person's. 
uh, that I've ever met. Uh, there, there's trouble, there's difficulty, there's challenges with raising support, there's challenges with uh, anything you can imagine. Facilities. I mean, we moved all over the place. I mean, years ago, I don't know if you heard about this, Saddleback proudly said that like in their first two years, they moved to like 20 some locations. So we were like on the Saddleback model of church growth. So we kept moving, like we were in a school and then they renovated, so we got kicked out, went back to a house, then we went back in another building, then we went back to our house, then we were in another school. So in our first like, couple years, we were at least five. So we're a little bit behind the curve, but we figured, hey, we've got to get huge soon because we keep moving. And it worked for Rick Warren, so it must work for us. But, um, but anyway, that's, everybody has those challenges, right? But a good friend of mine who was planting in Seattle... Uh, and, and if you don't know, Seattle's one of those places, very unchurched, a lot of challenges, a lot of um, just nature worship kind of stuff, a lot of just everything doubting God. There's just not a culture of, of God there. It's, it's actually very different than here in San Diego where it's a lot more conservative. Even though there's not necessarily a lot of Christian people, there's a lot more openness in certain ways here than in, in Seattle. And he just had this heart to want to bring all these people to salvation in Jesus Christ. These people that wouldn't be attracted to other churches or wouldn't even go, and all kinds of communities of people that are really entrenched in their own lifestyle but don't want to be brought into the church. And he was going to be the guy who was going to go in and minister the gospel of Jesus Christ and sow that seed. And he faced all the same challenges that I faced. We talked, and his story was my story. And he got to the same crossroads that I did. And today, my friend is also pretty much an agnostic. <laughs> he went from, you know, a church planting guy with a heart for God to every cause you could imagine he stood before, he's the opposite now. If he, stood, if he was, you know, for saving babies and pro-life, he's a woman's choice. If he was for the sanctity of marriage and between a man and a woman, he's for, hey, if you love each other, who cares? I mean, every issue you could name, he's at the polar opposite now. We're still friends on Facebook, and I can read the profanity that comes across as he talks about every, all these issues in his life. Stuff that would be horrible for him, he would have never said before, but now is just freely flowing. The anger towards God and church just come out. See, we all get to this crossroads, but the choices we make or what determines which path we're going to go. And that's where we are here. At this crossroads, it says, I find strength in putting my heart and mind in God. Verse 16, this is that center of the psalm. Asaph says, But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. And now you're saying, now how does he get that idea of heart and mind out of that? Because really what he said is this, all of a sudden, I stopped and I took a breath from all this. Instead of putting my mind on all these things, like if you go back and read those verses, what did he say about all those bad people? I saw them prosper. I saw them do this. I saw them. His eyes were fixed on the people doing this stuff wrong. And his eyes were fixed on all these speed bumps and all these roadblocks and all these challenges. And he finally took a moment to take a breath. And he said, oh, I'm tired. This is too much work to focus on all that other stuff. Because the truth is, everybody faces these things. Whether you are a follower of God or a follower of the world, you will face all of these same challenges. And worrying about those things uh, does nothing but wear you out. I've been there. I've been there a lot in the last couple of years of my life. Just tired of worrying about that stuff, asking these same questions of God. And that's tough to be at that place because you don't think you should be there, but you are. And that's where he starts to turn things around. So that speed bump number three where he was living and sacrificing for God, hey God, is that worth it? Here's the detour he finds. This is detour number three in your notes. He says, Prosperity in the world is a dream. The life to come is reality. Verse 17 through 19. He says this, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. He's talking about the end of the wicked, those who he's been looking at and focused on. 
It says, Truly you set them on slippery places. You make them full, fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. See, this poetic language that he's coming across is this idea that now that he's been able to enter into God's presence, the sanctuary of God, symbolizing just simply putting his mind on who God is, he's been able to discern the truth of his situation. And again, it's poetic, and he's saying, hey, it's, it's a, this world is the dream and reality is the future. He's not saying what happens here doesn't matter. He's not saying it's not real in that sense of the word. Again, it's poetic because he's talked about how these guys who are doing all this bad stuff, they've set their own dreams, right? They said, here's my dreams and I'm going to reach for the stars and I'm going to accomplish it and I don't care who I run over to get there. I don't care who I deceive or who I lead astray. I can watch any number of televangelists on TV and tell you how horrible their theology is and how destructive it is to people I've seen whose lives have been ruined and it bugs me when I've met so many people, many of them given so much, sacrificed so much to give to these charlatans, some of them who have been to jail for embezzlement of money. They get out of jail, they get a TV show again, and people still give them money. That bugs me. Right? But it says he has been able by entering to, into God's presence, by taking his mind off those people and putting it on God, he sees the true end of all these things. That they might look like they're prospering, but ultimately it ends in their defeat. It ends in their destruction. God will hold them accountable for the sin that they commit and the people they lead astray and harm and hurt. And the heart pangs that I feel for those being hurt by them Someday, God will bring them peace and comfort Amen. for the suffering they go under. See, that's this detour. To, when I put my mind, I recognize the reality of where I stand on this journey. And if I can put my mind on God, I recognize that living and sacrificing are worth it because I receive God's blessing in the end and His justice and his mercy and his goodness will come into my life for all of eternity. So let's look back, speed bump number two. We said, does God really care about what happens in the world? How do we get around that? Well, detour number two is this. God's goodness is always evident in this world. See, before he was questioning, does God really even care? The people who were mocking God are saying, God, he doesn't exist. I'm up here in heaven. I know. I see it. All you little people down there, you got nothing. Because I'm up here and guys, no God. Follow me. But he's saying, look, when I put my mind on God and not on these people, I see that God is, all, his goodness is always evident. Starting in verse 20. He says, like a dream when one awakens, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. They are the dreams. See, before they were mocking God as, oh, he's just a dream, a fantasy. God's just a fantasy for you Christians, right? He's not real. It's just a delusion you tell yourself so you feel better about your pathetic lives. I've read that before, so I didn't make that up. Somebody's told me that, actually. Um, you know, I mean, I've heard those things. But he's saying, God, when you awake and when you rouse yourself, again, that poetic language, God isn't really up there sleeping, snoring. He's saying, actually, God, when I finally come to the recognition of who you are, then I see that you are awake. You are aware of all these things going on. And you despise those things as phantoms. Those are nothing to you, God. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in the heart, I was brutish and arrogant. I was like a beast towards you. See, now his focus is recognizing that, you know, I, instead of looking at all what these guys who are the bad guys are doing... I turned that to look at myself. And I recognize, although there's no sin here, it's just by looking at all these challenges and roadblocks, instead of God, instead of entering into him, he wasn't really aware of what was going on in his own life. I was like the beast towards you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. See, at the beginning in verse 1, he said, as if I was slipping, I was slipping. But no, God, it's you that's holding my hand. You are the one holding me upright. You guide me with your counsel. And afterwards, you receive me to glory. 
Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And so now we're beginning to move back through each one of these little speed bumps and Asaph is giving us God's detour around these challenges in life. And he's recognizing that when he puts his heart and his mind on God, when he rests in Jesus Christ and his provision, there's peace there. See, there's no peace to focus on all this junk. I haven't found it by looking at that stuff. In the challenges that I faced, if I keep my eyes on these roadblocks, nothing's going to happen. And I'm going to stay at that crossroads, choose the wrong path. See, those friends of mine that have fallen away, and I could name, honestly, I could name for you right now 15 people just off the top of my head. Former youth kids, friends who had been to seminary, pastors, that all in the last few years have walked away from everything that they've ever known in Christ. I could name them, and I can see their faces. They weren't able to overcome these things. And it's that old phrase there, but for the grace of God go I. I'm not, I'm not any better. The fact that I'm here speaking to you, the fact that I speak in PCU and help teach there, that I lead a, a small group here, has nothing to do with the fact that I'm a great guy. It has to do with the fact that I was able to find my strength and rest in God instead of on all this other junk. Let's look back at speed bump number one. It said, God is good, but maybe he does not care for me. Yeah, God, you're great, but do you love me? And there's detour number one. It says, God is good and he gives me strength. Yeah, he does care for me. Matter of fact, he's the one who's giving me strength in my life. In verse 27, in the first part of 28, it says, For behold, those who are far from you shall perish, and you put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. Does that sound familiar, that but for me? Go back to the very beginning in verse 1. Say, God, you're good, but for me, do you really care? And now he's gone through this whole journey in this psalm, and he's taken us through this whole challenge of life, and he says, you know what, God? You're not only good, you're just. See, I knew you were always good, but now I know you're also a just God, and you are sovereign, and you're going to take care of all these things I face, but for me, It's good just to be near you, God. The ability to be near and close to God, to enter into his presence, to pray and to sing and to worship and to study the scripture. Those things are what's going to give us peace from all the junk that that wants to tear us down and destroy us in life. There's not, it's not five happy hops to a better faith. There's not a secret thing. You go and buy a book and a self-help program and do all these things and check off the list and then you'll be better. It really is this simple. Spend time with God. It really is. Okay, I'm going home now. Goodbye. That's it. <laughs> so why do we talk every week in Hilton here? Because we've got to be reminded of the simple things. Right? Okay, I will. <laughs> So, that's where we're at. He says, but for me, God, you're good. Now, let's look at this crossroads. We saw when he traveled on this journey, he entered this crossroads of faith and doubt. And he said, I find strength in putting my heart and mind on God. But that's not enough. There's something past that. And I'm going to call this the fast pass. Because when I was traveling with the company I was working for before I got laid off, and now I'm unemployed, But I would travel a lot around Southern California, drive all over the place. And I had those lovely little fast pass thing in my window. So when all the other people, the peons who couldn't get one of those fast passes, were stuck in traffic because they didn't have anyone wanting to ride in a car with them, I didn't care because I could get in the fast lane all by myself. I don't have a partner, but I get fast pass. And I could get past all that stuff, right? 
I could get past all the junk that was there and get through that. Well, God has sort of this fast pass for us. And it comes at the end of Asaph's poem. He says, not only do I find strength in putting my heart and mind on God, that's the decision he made at the crossroads, but now the fast pass is I find strength when I put my thoughts into action. See, God wants us to do more than enter into his presence. So there is something. It's to take action on what that is. The last part of the last verse of Psalm 73, pay t- attention to that, it says, But for me it is good to be near God. It says, I have made the Lord, that is Yahweh God, my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. See, I love this because it's the first time in this poem he uses the personal name for God. It's the first time he takes God's personal name, Yahweh, and puts it into this poem because all along he's been struggling with his relationship with God. But finally, after he's entered it and after he's put his mind on who God is in his life, now he's ready to take action and he recognizes that all of that comes out of this covenant relationship of love that God has given him. And so he says, God, because of this relationship, I can call you by the most intimate name you've given me, Yahweh. I can call you Father. I can call you Daddy. Jesus says we can call him friend. Why? Because we're in this covenant relationship with God. He's established it. He's done all the hard work. I just have to enter in. But now that I've entered in, and now that I have this intimate relationship with you, God, There's a purpose. There's a mission you have for me. And it says that I may tell of all your works. See, throughout this whole poem, go back and check it out. What did he say? What what bugged Asaph throughout this whole thing? It was the fact that all these bad people were not just bad, but they were leading others astray, right? They They were wicked people who were distracting God's people from his good work. And what's the thing that bugged him when he stood at the crossroads? He said, if I would have acted out on this, I would have deceived your children, your generations. I would have been just as bad as that wicked dude because I'd be leading your people astray. See, it's not being honest about the struggles. I mean, I've shared with you my own struggles today. But... I share in a way to encourage you in the midst of your own struggle. Not to lead you astray like, hey, yeah, I struggle too and God stinks, you know. I have plenty of friends who say that. And guess what? I've seen them lead others astray. Because I read my friends who write on their blogs and do their stuff and they get all these comments. Yeah, I've struggled with the church for years too. I'm so encouraged by reading your blog because now I've left my church. Serious. Oh, you've given me the the freedom now. I feel so free that I can do it my way now instead of following that church God stuff. I'm so done with that. I read that every day. I, I literally read that every day from different people. But he says, look, now that I've put my mind on you, you give me the strength so I can tell others of your good works. And those are the last two things you need to know. You need to tell people about God And you need to lead people towards God. That's your mission. That's what God has for you. When you enter in, don't just be happy that you've entered in. You need to bring other people with you. Because you're going to lead them somewhere. All of us get to the crossroads. Which road are you going to take them on? Faith or doubt? If you can enter in to faith, you can draw other people. But you've got to speak out with confidence and love about what God is and who He is in your life. Don't be ashamed of who God is and He's the strength that He is the one holding your hand and keeping you from slipping. Share that with as many people as you can. Don't hide your faith on Facebook or Twitter, wherever the heck you hang out with online or at work or at school, all those things. You need to tell people. And then you need to demonstrate something of God's love through your actions and then you need to lead them. And I'm not talking about just non-Christians saying, lead them in the salvation prayer, which is great if you got that opportunity. I'm just talking about anybody, even a fellow Christian brother or sister who is struggling. You need to lead them towards God instead of driving them away from God. That's your opportunity. 
If you look at your connection card, and we'll, I'll pray in a moment here, but if you look at your connection card, there's an opportunity there. If, if you are struggling and need to find a way to enter into God's presence, to find His sanctuary in your life, check that. I will contact you this week, um, and, and, and I'll pray with you. And then we'll see about where we can get you on a more permanent basis into a small group somewhere, because you need that. We all need that. Okay, so check that off on your connection card and, and I will follow up with you. But I want you to come to this place of rest with God so that you can find peace in your life. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I'm just thankful for today, the opportunity to share the journey you have me on, the journey of Asaph. And uh, God, really, I think the journey that so many in this room are probably on in one place or another. God, I pray that you give each of us encouragement that you give us your peace and your strength to follow you and to serve you with all of our heart and mind and soul. And I pray we do it as a community, not as individuals, God, but as a community of people. Let's work together to live for you in Jesus' name. Amen.